Hello, everyone. Hello, Cardinal Ambrosic. Hello, all of our friends and family, parents, uh, students, former students, as well as our existing students. Welcome to uh, Spilling Tea with Minardi and, of course, Dr. Mark McGowan, who I will introduce uh, to you in a little bit. But first of all, uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the opening song. It is Under Pressure from Queen and David Bowie, and it is a favorite of Dr. McGowan here, and we're uh, so happy to play that as our introduction piece. And uh, for all of you who are following us for the first time, or perhaps are just uh, uh, filling in or joining us for the first time on Spilling Tea, uh, welcome. Spilling Tea is a safe space to be authentically you. It is a space to share the real you and a space that allows for your gifts to be shared with others. Ultimately, we have created a space to celebrate the goodness in all people uh, who live out their call to ministry and the service to others. In all of this, we keep in mind our young students, our teenagers, our young adults in university life, all those who are striving daily to find true happiness and seek their authentic gifts. This segment will allow for our students to hear the stories the personal journey, moments of vulnerability shared by our speakers who are loved unconditionally by a merciful and compassionate God, just as they are. So as we spend the next hour together, sit back, enjoy, relax, and hopefully we can get all of your questions asked. We have a whole list here, and uh, we'll spend the next hour uh, asking those questions to Dr. McGowan, and hopefully getting you a little bit more information, not only on Dr. McGowan, but also on Catholic education. As you know, this is Catholic Education Week, and so it is fitting that we have with us Dr. Mark McGowan. So, Dr. McGowan, before I introduce, uh, talk a little bit more about you, why this song? What a beautiful song. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it, it, for a number of reasons. I mean, I like both, both, both artists. I mean, both Queen and, and, and Bowie are classics, and... Uh, um, it, I think there's a great message for those of us in the pandemic. I mean, we are under pressure in a different way. And if you listen to the lyrics carefully, I mean, it's, it's, it's love that gets you to care for the people on the streets. So I, I encourage everybody to watch the official video because it's, it's a powerful reminder of, of, of what we have to do living <laughs> under pressure. And I think the, the most important reason is, is that when I was taking care of my granddaughter, my eldest granddaughter, uh, um, it was her favorite song for us to play in the van. And so she would <laughs> always say, Poppy, under pressure, under pressure. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and I remember they were living in Ajax at the time. We live in Whitby. And I knew I could get through under pressure twice by the time I left my driveway to get to their apartment building <laughs> in, in Ajax. So, no, and she's still, you know, when we ride together, she's 11 now, um, you know, she still, she still remembers those times when we played under pressure. So it was, so I thought when you asked about a song, I, I love lots of songs, lots of different genres of music. But this one, I just thought, just hit, you know, a number of right themes. And by the way, one thing that you should get clear, uh, Angelo, is that um, Dr. McGowan was my uncle, the veterinarian in Cornwall. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just Mark, okay? So it's just, uh, All right. I, I get really uncomfortable when people call me uh, Dr. McGowan because I have visions of my uncle's surgery in Cornwall <laughs> or going out oh, to no. farms and doing uh yeah fixing cattle and, and and such which is a good thing but um yeah he had some great stories so yeah. well well one one uh, one thing i'm looking forward to in the next hour is is your storytelling you certainly are a storyteller a, a historian that's for sure but let me just for all of our audience first tell a little bit more about the academic if you will uh mcgowan mark mcgowan uh we'll tell uh, a little bit about that and then also um we'll conclude with your your, your family makeup so uh, Mark McGowan is a professor of history at the University of Toronto uh, and former deputy chair of that department. From 2014 to 2016, he served as the senior academic advisor to the Dean of Arts and Science on International Matters. And prior to that, he was special advisor to the vice provost of students and then acting vice provost students at the University of Toronto. From 2002 to 2011, he served as the principal of the University of St. Michael's College and he has now returned to that role as the interim principal and vice president to help the university navigate its way through the COVID-19 pandemic. He has been the recipient of four university teaching awards, 
Mark specializes in Canadian, Irish, religious education and immigration history. Uh, he has written a number of books. Uh, in particular, I wanna draw attention to his fourth book, which is The Imperial Irish, Canada's Irish Catholics Fight the Great War. That sounds interesting, 1914 to 1918, which was only recently published in 2017. And within the Catholic educational circles, he is known for his booklet and film, The Enduring Gift, which I know is very familiar with many educators, The History of Catholic Education in Ontario, and his service in 2014 as a trustee in the Durham Catholic District School Board. His latest book, uh, published in March of 2019, so just a year ago, or over a year ago now, is called It's Our Turn, Carrying on the Work of the Pioneers of Catholic Education in Ontario. And believe it or not, he is writing another book exploring what happened to nearly 2,000 Irish children who during the Irish famine were orphaned upon arrival in Canada. Mark lives in Whitby and his wife Eileen, who was a former colleague actually, a former colleague of mine as a chaplain, uh, is a musician and a retired chaplain in the Durham Catholic District School Board. His five children all live in the GTA. This is wonderful, I love this Mark. A teacher, archeologist, gallery manager, a board game cafe slash pub owner and a social activist. And he has four grandchildren. How, like, you know, we, we all say, those of us who have children, that they're all very different. They're all very unique. Now, now that's unique. That's as unique as it gets. <laughs> yeah, no, right. they, they, you know, none of them are the same. And, uh, um, but I mean, all five of them have the same core of values, but I mean, it just, and they just chose to express it in, in very different ways. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, Erin is uh, teaches in the Durham uh, District Board, and she works in one of well, up until her latest maternity leave, right, you know, right. worked in one of the toughest inner city schools in Oshawa. But that was what she feels she was called to do was to work in those schools. And uh, her youngest brother, who's you know ten years younger than she, I mean, he's an ongoing activist on so many different issues. So it. Uh, um, it's kind of a, a stream that runs between the five of them, depending. And, and I guess the archaeologist, I mean, she's kind of living my dream because yeah. I, did, I, I mean, I didn't want to be a historian. I wanted to be out in the field. Uh, I think when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark for oh, the yes. first year, for what, 1979, I mean, um, I was in university at the time and uh, University of Ottawa didn't have an archaeology program, but I would have been right in there <laughs> even though i've subsequently learned that indiana jones was more a grave robber than he actually was an archaeologist so it's just <laughs> <laughs> very good very good uh look I, i'm excited for so many reasons and there's so much i want to share tonight and 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 have you share uh so i'll do my best to try to touch upon uh, all of the different things that uh, i'm hoping to uh, have answered tonight but but certainly what we want to do is get to know mark we want to get to know the personal mark and, and maybe have you share some of your personal experiences and stories for our, for our viewers, especially our young people uh, at a time like, uh, like we are now in Catholic education, publicly funded Catholic education. We hear so much and we're, we're experiencing so much in our schools. And so uh, it'd be nice to also hear a little bit about uh, your thoughts on that and, and where we are today with that. So first, Mark, let's just start really light. And uh, I'd be curious just to find out a few things like a favorite food. Do you have a favorite food that you enjoy eating? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I like to eat, but I'm a pretty basic eater. And if I were to go out to a restaurant and really want to be special, it would be Virginia glazed ham with a pineapple slice, scallop potatoes, corn, uh, and uh, and peas. Uh, or um, I like I like chop suey a lot too. So it just really uh, yeah, and uh, or anything on the barbecue. Um, yeah, I'm not fussy. Uh, it's kind of a, a Franciscan habit. You you kind of eat what what That's people right. put in front of you. And I was always funny. taught, you know, you eat what's in front of you. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, if I went out to a restaurant and I, I haven't been to one in a long time. That's right. You know, it's usually uh, those are the kinds of things. Uh, but you know, sometimes we eat vegetarian, and sometimes we 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 are pescatarian. So I mean, yes, a, yeah. a, a, a lovely piece of fish. I always feel where I go. Uh, so I was doing a lot of field work in Halifax in 2013, 2014. I ate a lot of fish oh, um, yeah. because you know, when in Halifax, eat fish. in St. John's, Newfoundland, <laughs> right. the same. In Ireland, it's got to be lamb, uh, Roscommon mm -hmm. lamb. 
absolutely fabulous. Um, and it's now become a standing joke among my colleagues that I work with uh, right. at the Strokestown Famine Museum there is that when Mark's coming, we're going to have lamb. So just, yeah. <laughs> very good. Nice array there. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, do you have a favorite movie? You kind of hinted to one uh, a little bit earlier, but oh, movie? I mean, uh, there, there's so many. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the one that I, I go back to all the time is Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's 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 a great film for so many reasons. Uh, uh, I mean, it's completely campy. Uh, it's a yeah. a good escape. Um, there's interesting historical bits in it. There are ahistorical bits in it. Um, let me tell you this. When I first saw the movie, I guess I was I was away, and I saw the uh, the clip, and it just said movie from uh, Steven Spielberg and uh, and George Lucas, and there wasn't all that much to it, and it just said Raiders of the Lost Ark. I thought, oh, this this will be interesting. Called my best friend uh, McGrath uh, when I got back to Ottawa because uh, we were both undergrads there, and I said, uh, got to see this movie. It's it, it's curious. I don't know what it's about. He and I. Opening night in Ottawa at the Elgin Theater, okay, on on uh, on Elgin Street, and we're about the only two people in the theater. And as soon as that rock starts coming down the inside of the cave, I know I'm going to love this film. <laughs> I called my girlfriend at the time, who you know, because she's now my wife. I, mean, oh, I said, there you, you go. You you got to see this film. And the next, literally, the next night, same time, Elgin Theater on Elgin Street. We got the last two seats no way. way back no way. in the nosebleed section. Um, that's how fast the word of mouth. It was just a, uh, it was a, it was a great escape. I remember working as a program director at a camp for developmentally delayed adults uh, right. later. And we put on a drama called Raiders of the Lost Cross because there was an old chapel <laughs> in the place and there was this old encrusted cross. And so uh, a few of the staff got together and we had we had staff members dressed up as Hovitos. We had 230 acres to work with, and we took the adults on kind of this tour. And uh, and it was kind of a, a rate. We had a horse in it because uh, uh, the guy who played uh, Indy in it and, and ended up as my brother-in-law and uh, Eileen's brother. Uh, he didn't know how to ride a horse, and you could you could tell the first couple of times we went in, and that was his great escape. He escaped by canoe, you name it. Uh, yeah. So I would say that film, you know, just. If it comes on television, I'll watch it. If I want to see something uh, a little more, uh, how should we say, uh, a genre, I like Casablanca a lot. There's okay. powerful messages in that film, um, great acting. But there's so many good films, uh, Angelo, that uh, yeah, yeah. Th those two kind of stand out uh, to me as uh, really fine. Thin Red Line, uh, a yeah, really yes. good film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I like film. And uh, so, yeah, that's really kind of a random choice. Yeah. yeah. How about, uh, I'm sure as a historian, you've traveled a lot, but even as a family, have you uh, traveled to a favorite vacation spot or a favorite getaway perhaps as a family growing up? Yeah, I mean, um, like originally, I mean, I was born in Western Ontario, but my father was, uh, became program director at CFRA in Ottawa in 1961. So um, we moved to Ottawa. So I really consider myself, you know, from the Ottawa Valley. Right. So. Mm -hmm. For 31 years, we vacationed in the Upper Ottawa Valley on the oh, Pontiac wow. County side in, in, in Quebec, renting the same place uh, or within the same at Sand Bay. So that's where we go. And actually, one of the photographs I sent you was um, uh, I was in a canoe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of the things I really like to do. Right. It's very, and I had my granddaughter at that time. She was, uh, I was teaching her canoeing skills like I, I taught all the kids. And uh, so that's our place where we go. Now, I mean, most of my field work is done in Ireland. So this has been really unusual. I haven't been in Ireland now since uh, 2019 because of the okay. pandemic. Right. I was actually supposed to be there right now um, because I was supposed to be on sabbatical and I was uh, going to have a, uh, uh, a research uh, grant in bursary at uh, Maynooth University, St. Patrick's wow. uh, University, Maynooth. It was uh, uh, the original uh, uh, seminary, uh, but it's now a full-blown university outside of Dublin. So, and I taught there in 2018 for a summer for U of T. So I was supposed to be there, but um, I've been back and forth from Ireland now, you know, once or twice a year since 2006, you know, doing, doing research and, uh, and really, you know, building up research teams of undergraduates at U of T that have come with me to, to do the work or, you know, connecting with uh, a number of groups there. So, uh, um, and Eileen has sort of been, you know, uh, 
part of that travel as well. Um, and uh, I'm still bound to determine because the next big book project, probably my last one, is uh, is going to be uh, a, a history of of Catholicism in Canada. So it's going to take me to Rome again and uh, oh. uh, work in the Vatican archives, Propaganda Fide archives, uh, and and actually, and then enjoy the food I really love is absolutely, Italian food, yes. as you can well appreciate. So, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last last, uh, if you will, light question. Um, how do you keep active? Is there like a favorite activity that you like to do? Hiking, uh, a sport, anything like that? Yeah, I'm a swimmer. And so okay. the pandemic has been really torturous uh, yeah. because normally I swim 2K every morning uh, here in Whitby. Um, and I've, I've swum since, you know, I, I can think of. I mean, I only started doing kind of serious early morning swims uh, daily in the mid 90s. Um, and it was really for cardio and i just right, came right. to well my father died when he was 40 of a, of a massive heart oh, wow. attack so i just thought as i was pushing 40 i should i should really take care of myself a, a lot better with all these kids so <laughs> yeah, yeah um sure. so i mean swimming is one thing canoeing as you saw in the photographs yeah. that I, that i sent you um that's that's a passion as well um and the outdoors i mean i am not handy as as eileen could probably tell you um <laughs> if it can't be fixed by duct tape mark can't fix it oh, um, so i was kind duct of a red tape green fixes it every, yeah. fixes everything mark yeah. so it's kind of a red green aficionado so it um <laughs> so instead but you know get me into the forest i was a, i was a scout leader for 14 years so um you know doing in a sense you know building in the forest survival tactics that kind of thing that's great. I love being in the wilderness. And it's one of the good things about taking the kids to the Ottawa Valley when they were kids and now the grandchildren uh, every summer is, is, to, is to get them out into, you know, uh, the wild country and uh, experience, you know, the glories of nature. And, uh, and it's a good break when, you, when you're doing um, university administration, as long as I have, if you don't have that release, you're, 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 you're kind of cooked. And I guess the, the last thing that's a great release is, is music. So one of the photographs I sent you right. as well. I mean, Eileen and I have played in a rock band now for 20 years. So, I mean, it, uh, uh, I mean, and that's been, you know, again, suspended by COVID because yes, the gig economy right. is, yes. Yes. is, has been, you know, put in abeyance for a while, but uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, it's sort of mind, mind, body, soul. I mean, sort of keeping everything in balance. It's, uh, uh, it's COVID has been difficult. And I think that's why I chose under pressure because you mean, yeah, absolutely. a lot of us are feeling under pressure. Our students are feeling under pressure uh, in the university. I mean, imagine this Angelo and, and you can't imagine it because you're working in a, in a, in a school setting, but um, last June, um, the, the grade 12s couldn't convocate as, you know, sort of the vision of convocation or, or graduation is, is so big when you're trying to, you know, move on from high school. And then that same group, that same cohort comes to university. There's no orientation, right. there's no res life. Um, there's, there's, there's no, there, there's no in-person life in, on many campuses in Canada. We had at least kind of dual delivery at U of T until mid October. And then right. the second wave hit and that was it. And, and you think about it here you talking about under pressure i mean you don't have a community to associate with i remember first year we were making friends we were we were you know building study groups and things like that uh but uh so i think it's it's been tough on on on, on a lot it's been tough on teachers um and the ontario government hasn't made that easier but i don't want to get too political at this you know at this no, point i no. mean that uh, that you know they are you know our teachers are frontline workers um, they put themselves in potential harm's way every day when they stand in front of a class and they know that they haven't been vaccinated, they haven't been prioritized in vaccination. Um, that will change, I'm sure, but uh, that should have been done long ago. Um, uh, and so I guess when I think about it, music's a big part of my life and, and choosing that song I think was, was more deliberate than what I think it was right now. This is, yeah, we'll certainly talk a little bit about that as well. Um, as you know, my wife is a teacher. She teaches in the Durham board. She's at St. Mary's in Pickering. And, um, and I've worked now 19 years uh, alongside teachers and uh, it has not been fun for them. You're right. They uh, you know, they feel that they've been, uh, you know, kind of isolated and left out to, to, to hang, so to speak. And, um, 
yeah, the government has not been nice to them. And you're right. They've put themselves on the front lines daily and I've seen it. And then the pressure of having to, you know, teach up until just recently students in front of you, but then also to be able or to have to teach online as well at the same time. And it's just, you know, on expectations that are just uh, way beyond what a teacher should be expected to do. But anyways, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little later. Let's hear a little bit about your personal story, Mark. I'd be curious um, just to hear a little bit about your, your upbringing, uh, kind of what maybe um, uh, made you passionate about wanting to, you know, to teach, become a historian perhaps, and then even up right up until your current role of stepping back in as principal at the University of St. Michael's. Or do you want to put everybody to sleep? I mean, really. <laughs> hey, listen, just, uh, we just want to get to know Mark first. Yeah. Then we'll go deep. Then we'll go deep, right? Yeah. Well, I was born in a 50,000 watt yeah. town in Western. <laughs> Did actually, you always have that beard, Mark? Did you always have that no. white? <laughs> <laughs> I actually was born in a 50,000 watt I was born in Wingham, Ontario, which at the time had the smallest, uh, uh, it was the smallest place in the world that had its own television and radio station, C <laughs> wow. CKNX in Wingham in Huron County. And my father was um, was a, a, a Torontonian, son of immigrants, and uh, but he had a passion for this this new thing called television and then and and radio. So he was a he was a broadcaster, mm -hmm. a floor director. My mother was was from the town of Walkerton, not too far yes, away yes, in Bruce well, County. Yes. You know, uh, unfortunately, famous for its water, but um, but a beautiful little town nestled in South Bruce. And she was, you know, kind of. Uh, graduated grade 12 with the sisters of uh, the, the school sisters of of of, um, uh, of Notre Dame uh, and then got this job at CKNX and became one of Ontario's first romper room ladies she was one of the original <laughs> Miss Bettys at I CKNX it. and I, I was born there um, uh, she so my, my and then my my father was transferred to Ottawa uh, well he didn't transfer um, Frank Ryan had this opening uh, for program director at a radio station CFRA which was like the big station in Ottawa at the time so my father couldn't so I was essentially raised uh, in Ottawa and I went I went to Our Lady of Peace school uh, in uh, a little village called Bell's Corners which became a suburb of Ottawa uh, and um, uh, went to St. Pius 10th High School, which what, by the early 70s was one of the last of the Catholic high schools in Ottawa because the whole system essentially collapsed after the Davis decision not to uh, extend funding uh, to grades 11, 12, and 13. So by, by 1972, the crisis fund that the Archdiocese had, had sort of set up to save all of these schools that were run by the Basilians, the Sisters of uh, the Holy Cross, uh, by uh, the Notre Dame Sisters, by uh, the Oblates, all of those schools sort of imploded. And one of maybe one of the reasons why I like Casablanca the movie so much is that St. Pius X went from being a minor seminary to being kind of like the refugee camp for all of the the students and teachers that had sort of oh, wow, you know right. as, you know left these schools. So yes. I had I was you know in Rich I had teachers who were a lot of lay teachers but I had bazillions, oblates, sisters of the Holy Cross, sisters of St. Joseph, uh, gray sisters of the Immaculate Conception. Oh. Um, yeah, it just it ran the, the whole gamut of, uh, and it was, Pius was like, you know, between, you know, 72 and 78 was like a refugee camp and, uh, and, and held together by a wing and a prayer most of the time. And uh, it really was very influential. I went then to the University of Ottawa um, and, uh, and I really, I, I, people said I should study law and become a lawyer and a politician and, and, uh, um, but one of the pictures that I gave you, Angelo, was a picture of me when I was about one. So right. it, was taken yes, well, it, was yes. it was taken well over 60 years ago. And, yeah. uh, and that was with my grandfather, who was probably the single most influential person on my entire life. He was uh, a German Canadian. He actually spoke German as his, at his tongue, even though he was three generations Canadian. He was from, from a farm in South Bruce uh, and my mother's father. But he told stories. People would invite him to come to wakes and, and such to tell stories because he remembered all. And he imparted stories to me when I, was, when I was a kid. So it was really important to listen and to sort of retain. And I think if there was anyone significant that made me think differently about a career trajectory, it was, it was him. He never knew it. Um, and I was his only grandson. So um, we invested a lot of time in one another. Um, fishing and uh, going to going to places. He wanted to show me 
you know, this site and that. And one of the ironies of it, when I was early teaching at the University of Ottawa, I was, I was actually doing field work for the book that came years later. <laughs> I was looking at monuments to, the, to World War I in South Bruce and Gray counties and such, trying to get a local feel for it. And he came with me and he could stand in front of that memorial and he could tell me, Yes, about those people and uh, yeah so I mean it, I ended up at U of T as a graduate student and wanted never to return to Toronto and uh, <laughs> uh, I taught for a while at the University of Ottawa uh, and uh, we had several children in Ottawa and then um, uh, St. Mike's had this job posting and to be quite honest Angelo I really didn't want to go back to U of T um, I, I just wanted to move I don't like big cities probably why I live in Whitby. Yeah. Um, but uh, what was really curious is, is that uh, things exploded at the University of Ottawa and there was no position there. And I was actually offered a position at St. of X, um, yes. which, which was really attractive. But I knew that Eileen couldn't teach there because why would they hire an upper Canadian when they didn't even have jobs for Nova Scotians? You know, it was... Uh, That's right, because many of them came over, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And... Yes. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. X was kind of like a really nice spot, but my thesis supervisor called me and he said, you know, if you want my advice, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a place where you come from and not go to. Uh, and oh, that, was, that, was, that was John Moyer, um, who was my oh, I thesis love that. supervisor. Yeah, yeah it, it, John referred to himself as a Catholic Presbyterian because he had oh. nine kids. Um, <laughs> but just, he, course, was, he, yeah. was, he was Canada's leading religious historian. I studied with him oh. and uh, he said, this thing at St. Mike's looks okay for you. And I thought, <laughs> okay, well, and uh, eventually that's, you know, I arrived at right. St. Mike's in 91 and uh, it worked both in the history department at U of T and then the Christianity and culture program mm -hmm. at St. Mike's. And then because of my interest in immigration and the Irish, I, I taught in Celtic studies. And then when I was principal in 2002, um, one of the things that I first did, I was, I asked colleagues, what would be interesting? What is it we're not doing as a college? And uh, they talked about McLuhan's legacy and they talked about um, book history and print culture and the bazillions sort of bringing, you know, Father Souleran bringing his whole library to St. Mike's when they were founded in 1852. Wow. And so I, we collectively, we thought about this program called Book and Media Studies, which is now the largest undergraduate right. program offered by a college. We have, we started with 19 students and now we have close to 500, Yeah, you know, Wow. you know, since 2003. So, I mean, those are the things, and then, you know, raising a family and sort of balancing, a, a, you know, aging parents and, and extended family and, and trying to, to, to live a balanced life. I hope I haven't put people to sleep at this no, point. No, no, I no, mean, this I mean, is it, an it, important piece, Mark. This yeah, because, I mean, there's, there's so much packed into, yeah. you know, that kind of life. And so it meant a lot of travel. And Eileen was a saint because when I was traveling to, as, as Marianne says to Indy in uh, Late Raiders of the Lost Ark, as I followed Abner to, you know, and his, to find his little pieces of junk, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I was looking for those little historical clues, which took me right across Canada. Um, and I must say, and, and I, and I want to be I want to be clear that I was helped a lot along the way. One of the people who helped me a lot was uh, Father Ed Jackman, a Dominican, former historian of the Archdiocese of Toronto, and uh, he, he helped uh, a lot of us. I mean, uh, Catholic historians in Canada owe a great deal to Ed Jackman. Right. And so, I mean, um, it's a shout out to Ed because uh, he was very important to our family when, you know, the, when the, the, the well started running dry and yeah. you've got a number of kids and yeah. job prospects are few, um, he found research projects. So, I mean, I traveled through Northern Ontario, you know, writing an inventory of every church, mission station, priest who'd served there from the 1830s to, yeah. uh, to that point about 1990. But uh, so, I mean, it's been a, a really interesting journey with lots of helping hands, you know, along the way. And uh, and sometimes the projects that I undertook were ones that I had no idea that I would ever touch in a million years. I mean, when it was a, here at your your school's namesake, uh, Cardinal Ambrosia, right. he he became a, a friend as a scholar. I mean, he was he was someone who was so friendly to historians because he was he had a passion about reading. Every time I talked right, to him, right. he wanted to tell me about the latest book he read, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. it was you know, and uh, he uh, and he was the one who wanted a book on the first bishop of Toronto, Michael Powers. So I was, I was commissioned um, to write, I had no 
inkling I was going to do that. It became such an interesting project because no one had really done any work on him before. And he's such, you, you talk about someone who's inspirational. It's this young Haligonian who, you know, is uprooted, you know, when he's 12, you know, and thrust into schools in Quebec. And then, you know, he ends up in this wilderness diocese as a bishop, you That's know, right. almost, beg, right. almost begging Rome not to go. I mean, he yeah. didn't feel worthy, but it, Cardinal Ambrose really wanted uh, uh, that story to be known. And, uh, and my condition was, is that, you know, I write it as a historian. This is not going to be a hagiography. This is going to be, uh, you know, warts and all, uh, any evidence. And one thing I've always respected about the late Cardinal was that he, he let the historians do their work because he was a scholar. And I think somewhat a frustrated one. I think he, yeah. would, have been, he would have been happy surrendering himself to books and uh, discussions. He would call me out of the blue. Angelo. I mean, it was just like, I'd be at my desk as principal of college trying to put out this fire, that fire. And yeah. he would say, you know, talk to me about the Knights of Labor. You know, oh, I just, goodness, you know, yeah, because uh, yeah, he was going really? to Arge he was going to Argentina and he was going to be arguing with a bunch of Jesuits that he knew down there about, really? about labor and the church. And uh, what, 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 did they hate the church? You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Well, I said, oh, <laughs> yeah. The, the co-founder of the Knights of Labor was an Irish Catholic, you know, and a devout one. So, I mean, a Terence Powderly. So, I mean, yeah, all kinds of people along the way that have been enormously helpful. And, you yeah. know, and Eileen, notwithstanding, has had to tolerate, you know, this, this course, life of a yeah, vagabond of historian. So that's so interesting. Yeah, you, can it, wait, you can wake up now, folks, because no, 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 this yeah. is good. No, th this because this will lead us right into the whole Catholic education piece. But it, it's very fascinating what you say. And, and I love the, the, that connection to the Cardinal Ambrosic, because um, my next question was going to be why Catholic education or why the system, but certainly, you know, Bishop Power would have had a large role in that, or at least, you know, as the first bishop in, 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 in Toronto. But, um, but something you said about Cardinal Ambrosic, which his family has told us over the years at the school, because we invite the family in once a year uh, for our opening mass, and we always have a family member speak to a little bit about the life of, of uh, Cardinal Ambrosic. And one thing they always mentioned was that he loved to just read books. He loved to just sit with a book and read. And then he'd have a favorite drink too, right? He'd have a nice yeah. drink right next yeah. to him. But, but that was it. That's what he loved. And he didn't like the attention. They didn't like, you know, being in a big diocese. Uh, so yeah, exactly what you said. So No, I think he would have been, if it, if it was, you know, the Middle Ages, he would have been quite comfortable in a yeah. monastery yes. doing, yes, doing reading and transcribing. Um, I, rem I remember one time I was coming in and we had, I just finished the first draft of the manuscript and uh, uh, he had told, he was lying on the couch and he had a couch in his office and he was sort of reclined on it. And yeah. he said, just read this book on the Che Guevara. <laughs> they really hate us down there, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, and I, th I thought, oh, I thought we were supposed to be talking about, he wanted to talk about Che Guevara. So fine, we talked about Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I found out, he was always intellectually curious and, uh, and, you know, that, that's, uh, and I think, you know, the, the family is, you know, I'm not going to gainsay the family. I think they're right. quite right. I mean, he was right. uh, very happy and he loved baseball. Yes. Loved baseball. Didn't like hockey all that much. I thought we were together at a Flying Fathers game one time at oh, St. Yes. Michael's Arena. And uh, uh, I had brought my cub pack with me and, uh, and uh, he was wearing a, a hockey jersey, you know, kind oh, of, yes. and uh, I was wearing my scout get up and he said, you look very unusual tonight. And I said, your eminence, you look very unusual as well. So it's just, he had a, he had a very good sense of humor. So it's, uh, but you know, Catholic education, I mean, it wasn't Michael Power. It wasn't all of that work. And the fact that, you know, Joan Cronin, who's a really good friend, former yes. director of ICE yes, yes. said, well, you, you were kind of a lifer in it. Cause I remember when, you know, being in, when I was in elementary school up until 1969, it was, uh, you know, was its own board. Uh, yes. It was a small, it was, I think, Nepean Township school section, you know, number one or number two. And we had a trustee's room right in the school, right next to the kindergarten room. I remember we would have to go by the, and say, you know, you know, oh, good morning, Mrs. Kreigsman. Right, she was right. the chair of the board, you know, and, and then it evolved into the mega school board. And then, um, you know, living through the crisis in, in the early 70s of, of Catholic uh, secondary schools. And uh, I remember being one of the student reps reporting to the Blair Commission when they were going to tax private schools. And this would be in 1977. Uh, or 70, 76, 77, 76. It would be 76. And, 
and I remember there were there were four of us from the school, and uh, they designated me to speak to the oh, wow. the provincial commission. And I did that with the the chair of the mothers club of the school and the <laughs> principal, who was. Uh, uh, Father Len Lunny of, of blessed memory. He just died. Uh, it was just an incredible individual, uh, uh, a diocesan priest from Pakenham, Ontario. And, uh, and then the head of the Parents Foundation and, uh, and the teachers. So, I mean, all, the, all of the stakeholders, you know, facing down the government. And actually, in the end, in a huge auditorium where there was all the other stakeholders, you know, from other schools in Eastern Ontario, staring down uh, the commission, and having written a brief, it was the first brief I ever wrote in conjunction with these other three students in my life. And then having to read it and being asked questions by, by Blair himself, you know, about, and I thought this is an important moment in terms of watching how community is built within a Catholic school, that it's, you know, it's, it's students, it's teachers, it's the staff, it's the parents. I mean, it's, that's how, how community is built and, uh, and we were successful, but that wasn't what got me into the, the either, but it just sort of, all of these little steps seemed to lead in that direction. Actually, what, what got me into it more formally was the Harris government. And yes. here I have to get political. Yes. Um, yes. When the Harris government came to power, um, the minister of education at the time, uh, John Snowbelin, decided to invent a crisis because they wanted to transform schools in their own ideological image. And I was asked by the Ontario, uh, uh, the Catholic teachers, uh, OECTA, uh, to help them prepare a brief um, to, to respond to Bill 104, the Fewer School Boards Act. Right. And, and they wanted a historical voice. And Bob Dixon, who was you know, uh, former director of education with uh, Gray Bruce. He worked uh, in Toronto Catholic. Um, he was a mover and a shaker. He was their lead and Bob asked me to, to, to come on board. And it was the first time that we actually had worked with the, the, the Ontario uh, Secondary School Teachers Federation as well um, to, write, to write briefs that would battle this, this fewer school boards act. Um, and then, after that, they asked me to, to uh, write a brief, uh, an affidavit, a historical uh, affidavit uh, to, to combat Bill 160, which gave me one shoe dropped, then the other shoe. And that's really, Angela, how I got involved in it. When wow. I did, um, it was funny because the Trustees Association actually, this was a dirty time for Catholic education because I mean, the, the teachers were pitted against the trustees and I was working for the teachers. And then I started being asked to give uh, public lectures on the evolution of Catholic schools and uh, uh, and maybe the disconnect between what was happening in Ontario and the legacy that you know historically that the schools had left and um, and I remember at the end of it it was Carol Devine who was with the Trustees Association said you know we've been on opposite sides of the fence on this but um, could you write a little book and that's when the enduring gift was born. <laughs> Really, and it's yeah. It, so it was really a court case, and really being called in as a historian, and that was what 1997. So you know what, 20, 24 years ago, and I've been working at it ever since. As I said, most of the big projects I've ever taken on were not done because I thought they were a good thing right, to do. Right, it was right. because somebody asked me to do it, and I would never have imagined me you know, talking about Catholic ed in a historic sense. Joan Cronin at ICE said, you know, we really should have a course for teachers on the history of Catholic ed. Right. Yeah. So I said, well, how about I try a test run at St. Mike's? And so SMC 313, uh, Catholic Education Ontario was born and it's still going. I mean, when we had the, 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 and it's basically, <laughs> uh, uh, for those of you thinking about taking the course, yeah. it's really the in, it's really the enduring gift over twelve weeks. So yeah, it's, uh, right. yeah. So Wait a sec, I remember that course. I think yeah. I took it. Now I don't remember if it was. Could it have been Michael Attridge? No, there's no way it was Michael. No, uh, no, it wouldn't have been Michael. Hold on a sec. He's he was a trustee as well. He worked for Durham as well. What was his name? Um, oh God. Oh, Peter Meehan. Was it Peter? Peter worked, uh, he's now president of St. Jerome's University, but Peter worked 
in the history department at St. Mary's in Pickering. I think I remember, and it was like a summer course. I took it in the summer as an extra course or an additional course. I remember he, that. In my he may year. have, yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, and Bob Dixon and I, um, he eventually went over to the trustees side in the second case, right. but we didn't hold a grudge and we actually co-wrote a textbook for the course. And so, <laughs> wow. and ironically, next academic year, I've agreed to stay on for one more year as, as interim principal of St. Mike's, but I'm gonna be actually be teaching that course. I haven't taught it in wow. a while. So, and lots has happened in Catholic education, but Angelo, this was for me kind of a, an, you know, I'm the accidental historian on this. And 24 years later, you know, it, it it's still happening. And writing yeah. the book, and writing the book was really, it's, it would not be something that I would normally write as a historian. But I wanted to write a textbook that was readable, that somebody could pick up and say, I want to read about this particular person, or I want the enduring gift, you know, in 18 pages instead of the original 12 pages. So, and I want a bibliography. And this book is really a primer. It's a source book, and wow. uh, the and Novalis wanted to publish it. So, I mean, it uh, again, I had no idea that this would be something that would be interesting. It, it came out originally of a series of articles in the uh, uh, the CPCO Principal Currents yes, magazine. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, but I added a few people to it and uh, uh, and some people have said, oh, next edition, you should add more people to it. And of course I can, but uh, yeah. I have all well, the time in the world, Angelo. Jesus. Yeah, that, <laughs> so, so tell me something, not, not that, you know, we'll kind of fast forward here a little bit, but, um, where are we today with publicly funded Catholic education? Because again, I, I've been in, in, in the public system now 19 years and certainly from when I first arrived on the scene, which was at All Saints in Whitby back in the early 2000s to where I find myself today in Dufferin Peel. Certainly the issues seem different. The, um, the urgency to, to maybe, you know, remain distinctively Catholic has changed. But as a historian, as someone who's over the last 24 years kind of written and journeyed and, and studied it. Where are we? How are we doing, Mark? Because uh, it, it is a conversation in our schools, in our public schools. Um, Angelo, this is a time of reckoning um, for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, it's a very unique system uh, because here we, it's, it's legally established, it's publicly funded, and it's constitutionally protected. It really is somewhat of an anomaly in North America now that the system that was equivalent in Quebec is gone and has been replaced by something else. The system that was in Newfoundland, which was all the schools religious, is gone um, to one secular system. Um, this, the, the situation in Alberta and Saskatchewan, which after 1905, when they became provinces, had, had separate schools, as they called them then, built in. Um, those, are, those are slowly eroding as well. So we kind of look at Ontario and it really is, you know, a last holdout. And it's really hard within a multi-religious, multicultural society um, where um, equity issues are, are so strong um, for the average ordinary supporter of a Catholic school to account for themselves as to, well, why you? And if you don't know the story, you won't know why you. And I think that, that's a big question. Sean Conway, former Minister of Education in Ontario and the actual Minister of Education who brought in the funding completion in 1986, you know, said, you know, it's, it's all about that four letter F word. Mm. It's not fair. Mm. Yeah, you were thinking of the other one. Well, I was. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but he said, yeah, but he said, you know, it's not, he's not fair. And so there's a, there's a fairness question that, that resonates with a lot of people. And political parties like the New Democrats and the Liberals who, who you know, previously had been supporters of the system, you know, are wavering now. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's a dangerous situation to be in. Uh, and I've heard that in the inside. I spent some, uh, I spent about uh, the better part of eight months before I became principal volunteering at Queens Park. So I got to hear a lot oh, wow. of what was going on. Right, right. Um, I had some, I had, I had a day to spare. And so I was helping out somebody who was there, you know, just advising. Uh, the, and this was one of my issues. I mean, it was, it was education. Um, I think the second thing is, is that there's been a, a very serious transformation in Canadian culture, Canadian religious culture. Um, 
And so those things that were givens, let's say when I was growing up with regard to, you know, religion, um, uh, religious participation, um, the, the value of the transcendent, um, those things are, are, are not as profound now as what they were, you know, 30, even 20 years ago. So uh, a book recently by two colleagues who are very good friends and really good historians, Brian Clark, who teaches at Emmanuel College, and um, Stuart McDonald, who is uh, a Presbyterian minister who teaches at Knox College. They wrote a book called Leaving Christianity. Uh, it came out just a few years ago. And they did an analysis of censuses since 1961. And one of the things that was quite shocking was is that the fact that about one third of Canadians now identify with no religious affiliation. Right. One third. That one in every three people in Canada are either no religion declared or they say Christian but no affiliation. Okay. Loose fish, so to speak, yes, out there. Yes, yes. The other thing is is that um, Catholic church attendance and Catholic and those who would declare themselves actively Catholic have fallen dramatically. I mean, in Quebec, since since the Revolution Tranquille in the 1960s and the early 70s, I mean, regular mass participation in Quebec is about 10 percent. Right. Um, in the rest of Canada, it's sort of hovering between you know uh, 15 and 20 percent, give give or take what province you're in. I mean, and it is a regional thing, but one of the most uh, I think. Um, how should we say, hair-raising statistics that they raise in their book is the fact that the, the least amount of religious participation among Catholics is between um, 12 and 25-year-olds, okay, or, uh, uh, and between 20, 25 and 45-year-olds. So you look at, well, actually, it's, yeah, it's 12 to 18-year-olds, so it's, right. and even younger, so it's our elementary school and high school population. That's right. And it's and right. And when you look at 25 to 45, you think this is the teaching teaching cadre. And this is not to cast any aspersions on, on, the, on the teachers at all. But it, it's an interesting yeah. kind of demographic shift in not only our uh, religiosity as defined by participating actively in a church, but I mean, it should raise alarm bells. So when Catholics given the first set of circumstances are called upon to uh, address these questions and sort of justify their existence within the system, okay? Um, you've got, a, <laughs> you've got a, a very big chunk of that Catholic population that probably couldn't. And I suppose that's why the storytelling became a matter of urgency with me. And I think that's why um, I wrote It's Our Turn in the Long Run was just so it would be a quick and easy that um, we don't have time to do a lot of things um, in our busy lives. But I tried to make a, a book that was short and sweet, that was written in a way that was readable, unlike my other books. And uh, <laughs> I always say, if you read one of my books, you get time off in purgatory. But I mean, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> we can all use that. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, so. I think those are two big factors, and uh, and I don't think there's there's political will to sort of stand at the wall again. Um, I think a third factor is is that a lot of the custodians and stewards of the story, so who lived through a lot yeah. of the stuff that I've lived through and even more, they've now retired. Sure. They're they've now moved on, and we had some giants among among that you know generation, so as I say oftentimes to superintendents in training and to principals is if you guys and if you men and women are not going to be the stewards of the story, who's going to tell the story, who's going to remember the story and who, who's going to know the constitutional issues that got us here. And in fact, we survived a lot of those scares in the past because we had a really good sense of what those issues were, that we were protected, you know, by this, historic you know development within the british north america act section 93 which is now the constitution act and it's still there it protects constitutionally these schools and it's a notion too now that fourth factor angelo <laughs> i could go on but no, the fourth please, factor is is that we have a really different conception of rights now than what we had before i mean um when catholic schools were conceived uh, back 
in the 1830s, and we, got, we had a, an idea of not only individual rights, but collective rights, that certain groups had rights by merit of being that group. So for example, over time, we've acknowledged rights for uh, certain religious denominations. Um, we acknowledge collective rights, let's say, during World War II for the peace churches, that they wouldn't have to be combatants, but they could serve in other ways. Um, we've recognized that women have, have, have rights within our society. We've also recognized that linguistic groups have rights. So enshrined within, you know, our constitutional framework is, you know, the rights of, of Anglophones and Francophones as, as, as linguistic charter groups in the country. Um, we have now enshrined rights for uh, Indigenous peoples. And I, I often say, you know, you attack one group's collective rights, who else is going to be next in line when the majority does not favor it? And I think we have a we have a, an issue with jurisprudence right now is since, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not gainsaying the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that came into operation right, in 1982 right, right. Uh, under you know, Trudeau the Elder. Um, uh, but what I am saying is that we have had a shift in our, in our thinking and in our jurisprudence from collective rights uh, being now overshadowed by individual rights. And so, um, and there's been some really good you know, writing on this. So, I mean, I think those are some, some of the big factors is that, uh, that we're, we're at really at a point of reckoning. And it's one of the points that I try to raise in the book. Um, and it's very difficult for young people, particularly given um, the number of issues that arise and they don't see the church as having answers for them. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're and that is, that is to say that I think each generation of Catholics in this country have faced a whole battery of issues. I mean, no, no one, you know, is afraid of, to go out on July the 12th anymore. And, you know, for fear that the orange lodge would, you know, you know, March, March through their neighborhood and then no. pound them out. I yeah, mean, right, they, right. we have, we have, we have, we have different issues that we have to deal with. So, so, so Mark, look, we're coming up to nine o'clock, but would you mind if yeah. we extended a little bit? Because I, I do have some follow-up questions, which sure, is sure. You know, just fascinating stuff. And, and um, we're not going to get through all the questions, obviously, but, but just, so I, I know a lot of the talk in our, um, in our public system, at least at the secondary level. And again, I'd like to get your take in terms of what happens when we transition to post-secondary at a Catholic college? Like, what, what, is the, what are the discussions there? But, but let's first just talk about the, the, the secondary level. Um, you mentioned something interesting there in terms of the storytelling, the uh, passing on of the story and the tradition by, you know, trustees or, or administrators. Um, for the most part, Mark, that is not happening in our public system. Uh, so that's of concern. And, and I guess simplistically what I'm asking you is, does it really come down to just the, 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 our faith story? Is that really what it comes down to? And, and being able to really grasp that and, and, and hold on to that, nurture that, if you will, and then, you know, go forward with that to keep the system intact? Or are we talking about something totally different here? Are we talking about, like you mentioned, individual rights, which at some point, whether we're ready or not, uh, that day of reckoning will come where, and I don't want to even say what that reckoning will be because you know what I'm, what I'm probably saying. But so, so I guess what I'm asking, first of all, Mark, two questions. One, does it really come down to our faith story being shared? And two, what is the role? Like what is happening from, from high school to post-secondary in terms of a leadership role? And are we doing our part? Are, are our leaders doing their part? Uh, so there's a lot of questions. There. I know. I'm sorry, but it's just yeah. it's, it's fascinating um, stuff. But, and we just been, you know. But the thing is, is I I don't want anyone to sort of parse out the right. story of of Catholic education in Ontario from the gospel story. Right. This right. is all. This is all part of of the same story. Right. And, and and this our chapter of it right now is is playing itself out because of the story. And that is, you know, um, uh, 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 the Paschal mystery, of the, the, the God who is present in history. That's one of the, you know, and as a historian, um, it's, 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 it's one of the things that, that nourishes me is that, 
you know, um, Jesus, the Christ, the God man, you know, is God entering history and being a player and being engaged in that history. But so that's part of the story. And if we don't know that part of salvation history, then I mean, we're losing the foundation stone of, this, of, the, of the story itself. So what does that mean? Is that, I mean, our schools should be, should be nurturing, you know, the students in a, in a, in a and, and teachers should be nourishing themselves through ongoing professional and, right. and spiritual development in, 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 in getting to the root of the story, which is, is the Paschal mystery, which is, means understanding, you know, the, um, the, the Hebrew Testament and the Hebrew Bible and, and salvation history through there. Um, understanding, you know, um, the struggles of the early Christian church, that's part of our story. And so why do they struggle? What is it that they believe? What is it they pass on in tradition to us? Tra traditio, handing on, you know? Um, we have to understand that that's, that's at the core of the story. And that's why Catholic, you know, Catholics in the 1830s thought it was so important that, that to, to have that, that, that a gospel-centered, you know, education system. Nobody, Catholic or Protestant, believed that you should have any schools, you know, in that period without a religious element. They felt the Americans were wrong, these godless public schools. You need, religion was an integral part of life to these people. Um, it's become less so within our own generation, but we have that we have that opportunity. We have that teaching moment. We have that space within our own schools, you know, that are legally established, publicly funded, and and constitutionally protected, you know, to be holistic, to deal with body, mind, and soul. And sometimes it's that soul part, you know, that. Um, if referenced, it's referenced in a rather fancy and eloquent mission statement and, you know, banners in a school. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be coming yeah. from here. And it's got to be people who buy into that. You know, so, I mean, you know, it's people who buy into the Beatitudes. Um, you know, Matthew chapter five. It's, it's, it's people who live that. John Paul II, when he visited during World Youth Day, I mean, one of the most profound moments for me, and I was doing a lot of the television work so i never got to the real event i was sitting behind a camera somewhere right, talking yeah, yeah. Him. but boy talk about you know making a yaki guy silent when he addresses the youth for the first time in toronto and the reading is matthew 5 it's the beatitudes and then he says this is the magna carta of christianity this is the great chat the great charter this is the pathway how how well are we doing in our schools with that um, I'll go to Mark 4 at the end of the chapter um, you'll probably remember it as you know Jesus is out in the boat and he's sleeping they say his head's on a cushion you know right. and and all his hell is breaking loose in the yeah, water and, right. yes, and, yes. And, and because he says and, and this is what a lot of people miss is that right. um, let's get into the boat and go to the other side going to the other side what, well that's the other side of the lake and that's scary territory. I mean, that's where they meet in um, uh, the garrison uh, uh, where the man is possessed. Uh, this, is, this is not their territory. These are, these are foreigners. These are, I mean, when, when Jesus casts the spirits out of the, the evil spirits, legion, okay, out of, out of the fellow who's been, you know, haunting the tombstones that nobody can control, he's breaking chains, and, right. and he puts them into a herd of pigs, and they sort of, you know, <laughs> jump off the cliff. I mean, people who herd pigs aren't Jews, okay? So, right, I mean, right, this, yeah, is, right. this is frightening for them, Angelo. And so, I mean, that's the second piece of scripture that we should take, I mean, it means taking risks. You know, how far do our schools go to the other side to take those risks? The apostles are terrified and, and some scripture scholars have said you know they the the way in which they are emotionally terrified is is made manifest in in just the scene of a storm and of course you know trying to wake up jesus to sort of calm the storm you know you, ye of little faith you know just let's go we're going to the other yeah, side yeah, yeah. you know so i mean it, 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 we have to be prepared as a system to go to the other side and sometimes that's really tough and it's and it's not all clear cut. Um, this week, we we're getting as in the daily readings, uh, Acts of the Apostles, 
And yeah. today's reading actually was a preface to what I call the Synod of Jerusalem. And, and so Christians have to be prepared, you know, Catholics, you know, to talk frankly among themselves right. and respectfully. Watch the way that said, like there are two opposing camps there, okay? Uh, Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, who are talking about, you know, the mission to the Gentiles. And the, the Pharisaic community that's come into that early church and the Jerusalem church insisting that new, new, new members, okay, of the body um, actually be circumcised because that's the Mosaic law. And the big question there then is, is Christianity portable out of Judaism? Is it portable everywhere? But, you know, they sit down, they talk, they work out some compromises. And so Christianity becomes a, a faith that is not sort of now saddled within a Middle Eastern context, you know, uh, but now has that, that sense of, of being universal and then now being taken to not just the Jews, but to the Gentiles uh, as well. We've got to think about um, civil discourse. That's an excellent point. When we yeah, have, so, I mean, point. I think those three pieces of yes, scripture, yes, the yes. Magna Carta of Christianity, yes. that sits at the heart of what we do as, as Catholic Christians, as Christians, period. Secondly, taking those risks. Yeah. Francis, Pope Francis says, you got to take risks. That's what right. does he say in e e Evangelii Gaudium? You know, I want a church that takes risks. Mm -hmm. That means going to the other side. And then you've got, you've got these beautiful readings from Acts, you know, in, in the Easter season. And this one always strikes me. When I used to teach my History of Christianity course, um, my students in tutorial had to read this, the, the first 16 chapters of Acts just to get a sense of, you know, the ebb and flow of the early Christian community. And I mean, it's, it's, it's an elegantly written text from, from the original. Um, it's written, as many scholars say, as a historical book, but when they get to 15, that's so important because when we do have disagreements and throughout Christian history, we've had many disagreements, okay? Right. Um, and if it wanted to get uh, biblical about it, we've had that conversation inside the walls and we've also had those conversations outside the walls. But we can't have those conversations outside the walls unless we've had civil conversations inside the walls. Um, the culture wars currently in, in the church in the United States and then spreading to Canada are doing us no good. Absolutely, right. Um, Absolutely. And, and so I think as a model, we have to go back and take a look at that, that Synod of Jerusalem back you know, in the early days of Christianity um, to see how we resolve. If that crisis hadn't been resolved, I don't know what the trajectory, I mean, I'm, I'm not prophetic that way, but I don't know right. what the trajectory of the church would have been. Are, are, do we have time, Mark, or we, have, we run, oh, yeah, yeah. Have, we out of, have we run out of time? Or do we have, like, no, no, I'm talking I, about in terms of, uh, I, no, no, I'm talking oh. about in terms of Catholic ed. Like, yeah, have we, um, can we still have that discourse? I guess that's what I'm saying. Or are we, you know, have we run out of time? It needs, and, and I think that's part of the, the mark for it needs right. cora courageous people to, okay. take, to take the risk to, to open the conversation. Right. Um, and that, that takes, inter takes place internally with, with in the yeah. schools. It, it takes place when we meet as partners in Catholic right. education. I think some of the most meaningful moments that I've spent with, with the system since uh, I guess 2002 were, were the, the, the symposia where we actually did talk to one another, um, where we actually um, had keynotes that sort of, you know, put things in perspective. And, uh, and I, I would say that we need more of those conversations and then we need action to come out of it. I mean, my own spirituality is very Ignatian that way. It's in, in some way incarnational, you know, find God in all things. Um, uh, and uh, 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 contemplation in, in action. So we can talk, but we also have to act. Absolutely. And, uh, and Catholic education is different now, even structurally from what it was. I mean, I mean we, one of the problems too is we may have been a bit spoiled by all the bells and whistles um, and uh, lost a sense over time of, of the sacrifice. Um, and that's what, you know, it's our turn also tries to sort of 
put forward is that that dreaded S word. You know, if there's something that you really want, so oftentimes you have to sacrifice something for it. Um, and uh, uh, and I know a lot of those people that you know I write about in the book did. Um, and uh, uh, Margaret Lynch, you know, you know, sacrificing her time as a, as a teacher in the formation of OECTA, going from pillar to post in the province to sort of, you know, get teachers to 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 band together to you know to essentially honor Catholic social teaching, you know, yeah. It's a, those are tough conversations, but it needs that spark plug. It needs that, yeah. that person or group of persons who are willing to initiate a very civil discourse. Um, one of the problems that we face, I think, Angelo, right now is that, you know, social media, you know, creates uh, a, a million uh, writers, um, but very few editors. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that, uh, and we didn't get a very good example of, of how social media could be used by the uh, one-term president of the United States. Who's, I think who's he just... got his Facebook account back for six months today. I believe. Oh dear. So, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> so look out. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate because so many people now, you know, are, are, are you know, glued to their yes, phones. Yes, um, and, yes. uh, and unfortunately, uh, as I say to my own students, you know, e caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, you know, yeah. just uh, <laughs> um, be careful of what you read. Right. And I think one of the things book and media studies at St. Mike's, and here's another shameless plug for the college, oh, uh, is, is, is it was McLuhan's idea of teaching, of teaching media literacy. You know, how do I make sense of all of, you know, that's flying at me? Um, uh, it, how, how do how do I sort through it? How do I analyze it? And I think young people, you know, are are particularly vulnerable, but they're also sharp. They can spot a phony a, a mile away. Mm. But at the same time, um, you know, we are we are in a time where we, there's a lot of information out there. How do we sort it out? How do we how do we sift the fact from the fantasy? Um, McLuhan's really interesting on all of these questions too because. In 1979, he said something really quite, one of the profound things he said was he anticipated, you know, this sort of technological revolution. And as a Catholic Christian, McLuhan said, you know, how do we preach or teach an incarnate God in a disembodied world? What would he say about our, so, you know, well, right now we're disembodied, right, right, right. you know, and, you know, we should be, we should be sitting in a studio chatting and drinking that's tea right that's with, right with a group you know i yes. mean but here i'm in whitby and you're in mississauga richmond, richmond hill richmond, richmond hill, hill. okay yes. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah so i mean you know what what can i say i mean and the people watching this are from you know all, all over, points yeah. in between yes yeah and we're completely disembodied um so McLuhan asked some pretty powerful questions <laughs> you know, in a, in a world that he anticipated, but never lived to see, because he was, he was dead two years later. But I mean, yeah, how do we, how do we preach a, 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 an incarnate God in, you know, in a disembodied world where, um, so, I mean, there's, this is, uh, this is an important time. And, uh, and I'm thinking it's, it's an important time for young people. Um, uh, because there's so many options out there. There's so many uh, opportunities and uh, there's so much information. Um, it's, mind, it's mind boggling information. I mean, where yes. do you go? You go to Google. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what are these things behind me? Yeah, you know, that's I, right. I, I don't know. I just, I'm not uh, sure what those are. They're on a shelf. Is that a shelf? I'm yeah, not sure. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let me end with this then, Mark. Uh, sure. I guess a twofold question. Um, and we mentioned the pandemic earlier on. So, um, how how has um, how ha how have you been impacted by the pandemic? Um, also, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about um, how our students at the secondary at the post secondary level have been impacted. And if there's anything you could share with our young people tonight, um, you know, and, and when I say young, from high school right up to undergraduate, uh, what would you tell them? So I guess twofold. One, how has the pandemic affected you personally and perhaps uh, university life? And two, uh, what message would you like to, you know, uh, yeah. tell young people? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the university, I mean, let's take it on a number of levels at the university. We've been, I mean, I've been teaching online. Because uh, right. as right. even as principal, I still teach because I believe you know, 
uh, principal stands for principal teacher. So, I mean, how can I understand what my faculty is going right. through, what students are going through if I'm not? So, I mean, I've been teaching online. I mean, I would much sooner teach in person, but, you know, I experimented with various studios. I didn't teach from here. I Behind me, I built a little studio and, and uh, it's, it's not the same, but you do what you can. I mean, the university, there's been, you know, trying to create a sense of community when you are disembodied like this is extraordinarily difficult. And I know it's been difficult on the students, as I said before. So professionally, um, you know, at U of T, we're anticipating coming back in person in the fall, God willing, uh, right. vaccines right. rolling out and uh, uh, the, the, the government and health authorities, you know, allowing us to do that. Personally, I mean, I mean, a lot of my activities have been, have been, you know, curtailed. Um, I mean, I have a big family. We, I haven't seen one of my sons for, since before Christmas. Uh, and another just lives in, uh, Brendan, who, yes, who entice who, you, yes, used to right. entice yes. you into plays yeah. and, <laughs> and such, you know. Um, you know, he lives in Oshawa. And I mean, we only see him at a distance. I mean, one lives with us still, but so we see it. But I mean, it's been disembodied family, disembodied from my parish community, because right. um, one of my children is is so vulnerable with a lung, con you know, with a lung condition and having repeated wow. pneumonia that if, if she got COVID, she could die, as her doctor has said. So we've been extraordinarily careful within the bubble with the, the with with a couple of the kids so i mean it's it's been really tough and i can see that i mean um instead of swimming i go out for power walks you know before dawn every morning just to sort of uh you know clear my head and and to uh, and to and to get some exercise but you know you know a lot of people are tired you know they and you see the signs no more lockdowns on the lawn and right. you know there was a parade in whitby a couple of weeks ago my granddaughter and i were driving oh, really? and, <laughs> and and down highway two you know it was like uh you know anti anti-maskers no anti the it. whole business I yeah <laughs> so i mean yeah i think they they marched in front of the mpp's office and then oh, we're going yes. up garden yeah. street to yeah. find the mp but yeah. the thing is is that a lot of people are frustrated and yeah i mean we, eileen and i were talking about it tonight it is very frustrating but um i think we we still have to have hope that we're going to see our way through this no one would have imagined a year ago we would have had vaccines this quickly and so many of them. Here we've seen a phenomenal amount of, of cooperation within the scientific and research community to do things that um, we thought not possible, but have been possible and now the rollout. I think the, the important thing about the rollout is we do it fairly, justly and equity, uh, equitably, um, particularly to, to uh, many nations who don't have the resources uh, or the distribution systems and to our own people. I think we're only getting a handle on how to administer these now, but these are signs of hope, you know, and it's spring. Um, yes, I, I, I feel very blessed, you know, to, to be able to, to go outside and, and to now work in the garden. And I have no green thumb, um, but you know, I have, you know, grass stains on my trousers. Yeah. <laughs> My message is, is that we can never give up hope. We've been alienated from the parish community, except online. Um, uh, but doing daily readings has helped. But I would say to students, um, it's really easy to sort of turn inward in these times. And my advice has been to turn outward. And if there is one little thing you can do for someone else that makes this just a better time, then do it. It could be for a parent, it could be for a sibling, it could be for the old fellow who lives down the street or just down the hall in the apartment block, just by saying, do you need anything? You know, and, and in that way, we're honoring the story as well. Because in an incarnational theology, we are the hands and the feet of Christ. Um, we are Christ, you know, in the world. Um, and uh, we are to be Eucharist to one another. And I would, my advice would be, best way to turn attention away from yourself and, and sometimes the problems and challenges that you face is to do something for somebody else. Um, 
and it doesn't have to be a big thing. Uh, Oscar Romero said, you know, uh, we can't do everything, yeah. but we can do something and do that something very, very well. And that's what we're asked to do. You know, um, we're not the master builders. We're the workers, you know, so that would be my advice. And I mean, it, uh, it, and I say that sincerely, it's, yeah. um, and I see it every day um, because I live near the Salvation Army. I live right behind the Salvation Army. Church, and I watch, I watch the bread line. They, their food bank has now been operating out of there. And I, I think maybe there's something I could do there or there's something I can do for a neighbor who needs groceries or just yeah. get out of yourself. Thank you for sharing that. Our, uh, our school prayer is, is taken from uh, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, which talks about being God's hands and feet. And that was, you know, that's just perfect. The perfect ending really to um, what we're called to do, right? And how we're called to uh, respond. So uh, Mark, listen, you, you know me, I would stay on here for hours with you. I really would. Like it, it's just, um, and I didn't even get into any of the, uh, you know, wonderful, um, well, I wouldn't say, well, probably ministry, but, but you were very present to me while I was on campus at St. Mike's there for a, for a year and a half. And um, I, I remember, you, you know, you'd come in and, and share, you know, your wisdom with me from time to time. And you'd take me for lunch, which was always, uh, you know, a treat. But um, look, I will find an opportunity to uh, hopefully have you, you know, in our school building when we're actually back. I would love our staff, our, 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 our whole uh, system or not our whole system, but our whole school staff, our secretaries, CRW, social workers, I'd love them to meet you. I'd love you to come in and speak to our staff and spend a day with us when we can do that again. And, uh, and really, really maybe have some of these very difficult conversations, but respectfully, you know, and, yeah. and, and yeah. talk to them about that. But uh, listen, thank you so much. Hey, Mark, for trusting I'd be, me on I'd this be happy. happy on. I'd be happy. Yeah. Now I just, my last word is, is that even yeah. though I'm from Ottawa, go Leafs. Yes, well, let's hope because I, I'm worried about Montreal. I'll be honest. I don't like the matchup. Leafs in Montreal no. in the first round. I don't like the matchup, but yeah, let's hope the Leafs uh, can do something finally, right? It's yeah. <laughs> I remember when they won the last Stanley Cup. So oh, man. Yeah, I'm, see? <laughs> I'm dating myself. So, yeah. All right. Well, Mark, listen, thank you again. Uh, I'll definitely be in touch. And um, yeah, thank you for spending a little bit more time with us this evening and with all of our followers at Cardinal Ambrosic. And, uh, like I said, I promise to have you out once we're able to, to, to meet the rest of us. Great. You take good care Thank of yourself. You so yeah. Thank you, Stay Mark. safe. Yeah, be sure. healthy. You too. And say hi to Eileen for me. Will do. Will do. <laughs> okay. And, and Brendan. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thanks, Mark. All right. Good All night. Right.